What's up, meta-nerds? Today we'll be breaking down all the variants of the AT-AT Walker. Truly embodying its name, we'll see how the Empire made this lumbering war machine truly an all-terrain vehicle. Using all legends and canon sources, we'll construct a full picture of this iconic Walker's variant spanning dozens of years in canon and more than a century in legends. If you haven't seen it already, I highly recommend you watch the dedicated AT-AT breakdown. You can click on this in the top right corner of the video, and it's also linked down in the description. But assuming you already know the effective base design, let's start with Legends. Covering the 8 existing variants in this timeline before switching over the canon, and exploring the 4 additional variants that come out in the Disney era of Star Wars. And starting off with Legends, our first few are a bit simpler, straightforward designs. With Big Palpy ruling a truly galactic empire, Imperial forces could expect to fight on a myriad of different battlegrounds against rebel insurrectionists and later New Republic forces. Specialized for deployment on desert worlds, Kuat Drive Yards developed the Dune Walker. The Dune Walker was a minor variant with identical passengers, crew, and dimensions of the base AT-AT, with the major changes being the replacement of potential tertiary weapon systems with additional Sinar Z-23 heat dissipation units. These are essentially air conditioning units, and though the base unit had these installed, they increased the number of them in the Dune Walker, and were specialized to better function in the scorching deserts of planets such as Tatooine. It's not hard to imagine the 40 Embark troopers and their crew in their heavy combat gear sweating enough to pass out in this giant cooking metal box of a walker. So while that might be a minor inclusion, it obviously was crucial. Now what you might have picked up on is that the AT-AT has no listed tertiary, no third weapon system, so it's unclear exactly what those heat dissipation units were replacing. On the other side of the spectrum, some of the walkers used by Blizzard Force were equipped with measures to better function in deep winter conditions. Nicknamed Snow Walkers, these winterized AT-ATs came with improved heat circulation systems to keep the crew and passengers warm, de-icing controls to ensure thick ice buildup did not interfere with the hydraulics, locomotion, visual, and weapon systems of the walker, as a lot of the really crucial tech, including the ground scanners, were located in the feet and could be under several meters of snow and ice. And so technically speaking, you've already seen these, it's just funny that the scenes that introduced this walker, we of course think of this as the standard at, -AT and of course outwardly it all looks the same, but technically they're specialized systems making sure everything is kept nice and warm and functional. And let's use that to transition to some variants that don't have specific names, as many Imperial forces found ways to modify their walkers to fit the environment they were placed in. On planets without a breathable Type 1 atmosphere, AT-ATs could be outfitted with special gas filters, while additional heat recirculators could be added for worlds even colder than Hoth or when operating in the vacuum of space. For planets with toxic rain or other extreme environments, anti-corrosive sheens would be applied to keep the walker's hydraulics, visuals, and electronics functional. <laughs> so if you want to get even more technically specific here, almost every Imperial garrison modified their walkers in some way to make them best fit their local environment. Places with more hostile natives or animal and plant life were known to pack on dense durasteel holes and extra plating, and some tried to mitigate the effects of radiation or chemical weapons. Looking to the first official combat variant, we have the Heavy AT-AT, featuring, well, heavier armor than its predecessor, but also stronger firepower, likely turbo laser grade as this was seen in some later Imperial walkers. And you might be thinking that the problem with this walker wasn't that it was weak. Rebels weren't shooting through it, and its weaponry was more than adequate. And while that might make sense, it's definitely a very imperial thing to do. Great for the war economy, promotional material, Empire Day celebrations, and to be a little fair, there were ever-increasing reports of rebels getting their hands on proton torpedoes and other explosives, and some had actually punctured the standard walker. So there is some practical aspect to this, even though it's probably mostly driven by the Tarkin Doctrine. The next variant is the All-Terrain Ion Cannon, which switched things up with a major redesign of the hull and weapon system. The majority of the troops bay was removed to make room for an open mount ion cannon attached to the rear of this walker. Sacrificing the troop capacity of the AT-AT turned this vehicle from an armored transport to a self-propelled gun, with that ion cannon being its main armament. While not being a factory floor design, the Empire actually sent back some stock AT-ATs to have Kuat undergo this remodeling. This walker did retain all of its primary head-mounted weaponry, meaning the reactor would have to share power between the regular base weapons and the ion cannon, so probably not able to power both at full efficiency. ATICs were not used as offensive assault vehicles, but rather as mobile defensive platform weapons for key Imperial installations. The ATIC was noted to be very uncommon, not surprisingly as base defense could already be provided by orbiting Imperial warships, dedicated, dug-in turbo lasers and ion cannons, and even starfighter patrols and artillery. The cannon possessed a limited firing arc of around 115 degrees, and was clearly intended to engage aerial or space targets, being most effective against capital ships at range from Imperial stations. 
like a supersized ion firing J1. Because remember, like we see with the transition from Venator to Imperial Star Destroyers, the Empire had an increased focus on ion weaponry, not wanting to completely destroy the enemy, but disable and capture ships, letting the ISB torture out any info they could get, and hopefully understand the chain of custody to find out how these vehicles fell into rebel hands. And you see the Tarkin Doctrine really drove this next variant, taking the rule of fear literally with this one, the Shadow ATAT. The Shadows were specifically designed separately from the main line, being 15.5 meters in height, about 7 meters shorter than the standard ATAT, while still keeping the same proportions. And of course that seems small when comparing it to the Ultimate Behemoth, but it still towered above other combat vehicles, though it likely decreased the power of its weaponry as well. So why design the Shadow differently? The simple answer is intimidation. They were coated in gleaming black armor, purposely meant to strike fear into the enemy. Though, funny enough, it had no specialization for stealth operations. There's no cloaking tech like we see in some ships or vehicles, but they were intended to be used during nighttime attacks or on gloomy, sunless worlds like Umbara. You might be thinking, really? It's just a glossy black paint job? But apparently many rebel soldiers said that this was one of the most frightening things they ever witnessed, as the shadows themselves started opening fire on them, and struck even deeper in the rebel psyche than the already intimidating AT-ATs. What's interesting is that despite the smaller size, it could still carry 40 troops, so it's just packed in a bit tighter but also losing the speeder bikes. One of the most dramatic modifications to the ATTE chassis originated from another local Imperial Garrison's modification and was so successful that it was officially adopted for factory production. The Aquatic Terrain Armored Transport, more commonly known as the ATAT -AT Swimmer, was a major modification that adapted the walker for underwater operations. Obviously, it's not a walker anymore, as its four armored legs were replaced at the hip joint with repulsor engines, effectively turning this thing into a submarine. The fifth engine at the rear drove the craft forward, while the bottom four possessed limited rotation to adjust the craft's position and provide additional speed when needed. The rear troop compartment was separated into two bays, connected by an additional flexible armor tube, much like we see connecting to the head or the midsection of the ATT. This one also retained its full trooper load of 40 personnel, and were assigned to the Imperial Maritime Division, which was a part of the Imperial Navy, but actually for water. 600 kilograms of cargo could be carried on board, while having a crew of five, likely two pilots, a commander, and two crew chiefs to manage the infantry once they disembarked. The AT-AT -AT swimmers' pilots were specially trained for this task, drawn from the ranks of the Imperial Army. The head-mounted armament remained the same caliber, with the weapons themselves modified for operation in underwater conditions. Along with the rest of the vehicle, everything from sensor tech to air intake had to be changed. The armor and its construction was designed to protect not only against enemy fire, but the deleterious effects of saltwater corrosion, as well as the crushing pressure of deep ocean operations. The head provided a wider field of fire than its already impressive land-based counterpart's arc of 180 degrees, and protected the aft of the vehicle with a twin blaster turret that would end up being mounted on some later models. In battle, the swimmer would deploy alongside sea troopers and TIE fighter boats for protection, engaging enemy targets and pressing through defenses to deploy their payload of infantry on crucial areas. This variant saw surprising success from its original modification by the Imperial Garrison of the World Cabera to its official production as a joint venture between Kuat Drive Yards and the Hydrospear Corporation, and would be used by Darth Krait's Galactic Empire as late as 137 ABY. By this time, the AT-AT -AT swimmer had undergone upgrades of its own, being outfitted with a dual blaster turret on the aft quarter to keep enemy infantry at bay as well as a launch bay for shark underwater fighters. The swimmer acting as a mothership in its own right, as well as a command vessel favored by Imperial commanders and Sith Lords alike. The AT-AT -AT lost none of its fearsome reputation as an aquatic vehicle. The swimmer may actually have the most fearsome reputation of any vehicle in Imperial history participating in the genocide of the Mon Cala, while being virtually impervious to enemy fire. The Final Legends variant also served Darth Krait's Galactic Empire, as well as the Empire in Exile that opposed it, this being the All-Terrain Heavy Armored Transport, or ATAHT. This was a major overhaul, with virtually every element of the walker changed in some fashion. The AHT presented a towering elephantine profile with a humpback troop compartment, covered in overlapping armor plates and weapon stations. A modified, insectoid command cabin featured two bug-eye vision ports on the diagonally sloped front part of the head, along with two twin-cheek-mounted laser cannons partially protected by armored shutters. Below the chin, a single and very heavy laser cannon was mounted, roughly the size of the ATTE's main gun, 
The humpback rear compartment rose to half the walker's height above the cabin, on which a dual heavy laser cannon sat one above each other on a vertical mount in a ball turret with limited rotation. Additionally, on each armored side of the AT-AHT, a single heavy laser cannon, again in a ball turret, covered the entire port and starboard sections of the walker from attack from enemy vehicles. Thus, this heavily armored walker possessed a minimum of 9 laser cannons, 5 of them being heavier than the standard AT-AT's main armament. There were no light blasters or laser cannons to deter infantry, which points to the Empire continuing their adherence to combined arms operations, in which the AT-AHTs would break the heaviest enemy resistance in vehicles. Infantry and speeders contemporary to this period would screen the walker's flanks, making sure no saboteurs could make their way in or hijack this thing, allowing the AHT to focus on its main objective. Since it doesn't have repulsor tech, it can walk right through shields and deliver the firepower of several tanks all at once and still carrying those 60 troops and still manage to pack in 8 speeder bikes and perhaps most impressively, 3 entire ATRCT, the riot control transports, a sort of upgraded and more deadly ATRT or ATPT. In this way, even without an escort, this walker could deploy enough troops and vehicles to form its entire own defensive screen if needed. It isn't clear if those RCTs were disassembled, like how some of the original AT-ATs could carry two disassembled ATSTs. but given its much greater size, I wouldn't be shocked if they were fully operational RCTs, sitting inside ready to be deployed via a boom system straight into battle. It could also carry up to two metric tons of cargo, and enough consumables for all the vehicles to last up to one week. The additional internal space likely accommodated a larger reactor to power the lumbering machine with its much heavier weight, and the only element not noticeably changed were the legs. The relatively smaller size of the locomotion system in comparison to the rest of the vehicle would make you think it had an even more sluggish gait, but it's actually noted to have an increased top speed, now hitting 80 kilometers per hour, or 50 miles per hour. By the time of the Second Galactic Civil War, the AHT had been relegated mostly to operations on worlds where conditions prohibited the use of repulsor vehicles, as other assault craft filled Crate's Empire's needs for ground attacks. It is worth noting that regular AT-ATs continued to serve Crate's Empire in an updated form. In fact, since the Battle of Endor, some AT-ATs were upgraded with dual turbo lasers in place of the dual heavy laser cannons as primary armament. So it's safe to say that these late AT-AT models carried at least dual turbo lasers. So despite all the flaws pointed out in rebel propaganda, in that greatest of enemy, gravity, it was clearly an effective design that was able to prove its worth as late as 137 years after the Battle of Yavin. But now let's look at the cannon variants. The first variant we see is fairly minor, a straightforward upgrade to the walker, being the Elite AT-AT, combining the dark armor of the Shadow with the heavier firepower and thicker armor of the heavy AT-AT. Its laser cannons were upgraded, which must mean that they became turbo laser grade. And Imperial commanders took the threat of tow cable attacks like those seen on Hoth very seriously. So seriously that the Elite AT-AT came with inbuilt saws right inside the legs that would sever cables to avoid tripping from such attacks. As you might guess, only the best of the best AT-AT pilots would become those entrusted to pilot the Elite. And remember, all AT-AT pilots were already known to be drawn from a pool of the cream of the crop of Imperial Assault Drivers, seen as the most arrogant pilots in the entire military. So just imagine how insufferable these elite pilots would be. But curiously, this walker has a very notable weakness, being uniquely susceptible to heavy ion explosives. So perhaps that's a flaw of the certain alloy used in the upgraded armor, being better at diffusing kinetic attacks, diffusing the heat of most lasers, but amplifying the effects of ion weaponry. We can guess that it had a troop capacity of around 40, and would have cost a lot more than the standard 150,000 credits. Next up is a specialized engineering variant, the All-Terrain Armored Cargo Transport, not to be confused with the All-Terrain Construction Transport. Neither of these ATACTs was intended to partake in direct combat, but was specialized for construction and engineering. Standing considerably taller than the ATAT, at a height of almost 32 meters, and a top speed of 50 kilometers per hour, or 31 miles per hour, it was classified as an armored cargo walker. The most notable change was the swapping of the two-tiered troop bay for an open modular cargo hold. This cargo hold was capable of accepting either a dedicated Imperial cargo container or vast numbers of crates, odd containers, and raw materials within its 550 cubic meters of internal space. Even when completely filled, 10 passengers could be carried on board as well. Stevedore or dock droids could be employed, along with Imperial Quartermasters, who would load these transports with supplies, particularly the ultra-dense materials which the ACT could carry with ease that might overwhelm most repulsor trucks. 
An electromagnetic tensor field reinforced the legs, especially the knee joints, to enable the ATACT to carry greater loads with greater stability. The Walker was staffed by a reduced crew of just a single pilot, typically drawn from any Imperial Armored Branch of Service. They were typically deployed on garrison, manufacturing, or mining worlds, where these capabilities could be used to great effect. Whether it be shuttling components for Imperial Star Destroyers, or minerals to be turned into armor plating and war material. They were used by the Imperial Corps of Engineers whenever military construction was required, from Darth Vader's castle on Mustafar to the Scarif Complex. While not intended for frontline combat, the vehicle was more than capable of defending itself against light threats and providing fire support to Imperial forces, whether it be against hostile wildlife or rebel incursions. Its legs, especially the knees, were always a weakness and vulnerable to even E-Web grade fire, although the vehicle as a whole retained the tough, durable reputation of the AT-AT line. Shrugging off a direct hit from a rocket launcher on Scarif, the walker's chin-mounted MS-2 heavy laser cannons were shifted to the command cabin's cheeks and the medium laser cannons removed entirely, lightening the overall armament. As an engineering vehicle, the walker was not intended for combat, but could be that first response or last-ditch reserve to augment existing Imperial armored forces if they were facing a powerful threat. And these you could actually get a bit cheaper at 125,000 credits. Just as Darth Krait's Empire deployed variants far into Legends, the First Order utilized up-armored and sleeker AT-ATs. The FO AT-AT, manufactured by Kuat's successor company, Kuat and Trala, saw service in the Battle of Krait and beyond, providing First Order forces with a familiar ground assault vehicle. This vehicle was up-armored, created with the next-generation lightweight materials layered across the hull, offering better protection at no increased weight. But notably, its armament was reduced to just the cheek-mounted laser cannons, dropping the iconic heavy chin laser cannons, which might actually be the worst thing we saw at Crate. While less powerful overall, these weapons were improved, being more accurate due to better targeting systems, on top of benefiting from a faster fire rate. Despite its size and power, the role of the mainline assault vehicle was replaced by the ATM-6, which I'll talk about next, but one other minor alteration I wanted to mention, placing of the frontal toe flap with this solid block meant to crush through obstacles as well as an improved shin armor to further protect against catastrophic leg hits. A cockpit ramp below the command module in place of the heavy laser cannons offers easier accessibility, but also a potential weak point in the formidable armor plating. Though it would be going into battle screen by updated ATSTs, just like their predecessors decades before. And now we arrive at the all terrain Mega Caliber 6. The M6 differs considerably in weaponry, complement, internal arrangement, and doctrinal role than all other ATATs, significantly departing from the traditional troop transport role into a dedicated siege platform. Towering over the competition with a height of more than 36 meters, about 1.5 times the standard, it brings incredible firepower to any battlefront. At 40 meters long, it's about twice the length of the standard while being an impressive 18 meters wide. The main armament of the vehicle is also its namesake, the Mega Caliber 6 Turbo Laser Cannon. Mounted in an elephantine hump along where the troop bays would usually be positioned, the barrel of the M6 protruded from an armor housing with its internal structure running deep into the walker. The cannon, being a starship-grade turbolaser, is capable of engaging shielded positions rated to deflect the attention of capital ships. Despite being mounted in a mobile ground vehicle, the cannon retains a moderate fire rate, outputting considerable destructive power. With accurate fire, the Mega Caliber 6 is more than able to destroy virtually any ground vehicle with a single on-target round. It can devastate even the densest defensive lines in most protected fortresses and fortified cities. A weapons room positioned on the gun deck serves this weapon, more reminiscent of a firing center on a capital ship, which is powered by a dedicated power plant directly above the weapons room. Heavy duty heat exhaust and shock absorbers help the M6 deal with the destructive blowback of such a powerful weapon. The ATM-6 is further armed with a pair of medium, anti-ship laser cannons on the cheeks of the heavily armored command cabin, these typically being the lightest armament capital ships would bring to bear on each other in ship-to-ship -ship duels, and more than capable of devastating any medium or heavy ground vehicle with a single salvo. This already obscene firepower is greatly strengthened by a pair of chin-mounted heavy laser cannons positioned between the angular jowls of the command module, which themselves are studded with horizontally racked targeting sensors. By its armament alone, the M6 does away with any pretense for any dedicated anti-infantry firepower, instead is solely dedicated to the destruction of highly fortified installations in enemy armored divisions. 
This extreme firepower combined with the power demands for such a gargantuan and mighty vehicle, and all this required an upgraded power system. Rather than relying on a bay of fuel cells, it utilizes a large fusion reactor embedded deep within the behemoth's lower rear section, kept in continuous operation to generate sufficient power for the weapons and locomotion. The dual hemisphere reactor, measuring at least 8 meters in diameter, is kept in operation by a supply of reactant fuel, with an outer shell masking an internal reactor coil in the extremely harmful energies emitted by its operation. A chain of four turbolaser gas canisters run down the ATM-6's sloped back, providing the ammunition for the main weapon, but also a potential target for enemy forces able to get around the vehicle's rear quarter. The Mega Caliber 6 cannon and the reactor take up the majority of the internal space, with enough room left for an auxiliary compartment capable of being swapped out with a number of mission modules depending on the walker's deployment. For the Battle of Crate, this compartment was utilized as an auxiliary troop bay, carrying 12 passengers into battle. It's possible this compartment could also be used as a dedicated command and control center for ground forces, or as an engineering space, maybe even a communications node during operations. Now of course bringing 12 troops into battle was hardly significant next to those carried on the smaller First Order ATAT, or what could be deployed through assault landers and armed shuttles, and it is incapable of deploying its troops through an assault drop through the belly, which is the ultimate sign of a departure from the troop transport role. Maybe all those guys on board are just meant to make sure it isn't captured. Its rear legs are mostly the same, but the front pair are considerably modified. It bears massive armored forelegs terminating in mech carpal foot structures similar to a simian. These redesigned frontal legs bear more of the ATM-6's considerable weight, but also are meant to brace the walker during the firing of the Mega Caliber 6 main cannon, ensuring it is a stable firing platform. The complicated system of heavy hydraulic pistons and overlapping gears that all drive the forelegs require their own ventilation gates, which were cleverly designed to work as cable cutters, severing any slim chance of these behemoths being taken down in the fashion of its predecessors. The entire vehicle is clad in hyper-advanced armor developed in secret foundries in the unknown regions, even denser and tougher than those of the AT-ATs. But like the standard, the command cabin is equipped with a system of sensor screens, providing the pair of pilots with up-to-date targeting, tactical, and terrain data, all from the onboard sensors from the JAL rangefinders to the footpad terrain sensors. A vehicle commander stands behind and above the pilots, typically with his own command dais, in the typically domineering First Order fashion. In summary, the ATM-6 amps up the psychological terror and overwhelming firepower classic to the AT-AT line providing First Order officers a nearly unstoppable siege engine to finally snuff out any sparks of the New Republic. My question to you is, of all those variants, which is your favorite, and if you had to choose between the ATM-6 and ATAHT, which of these supersized armored titans would you prefer to use on the battlefield? And could one of them defeat the other in a 1v1 match? Let me know in the comments down below. Now for a couple of cool facts and behind the scenes stuff, the ATM-6 would be roughly equal in height to the massive redwood trees in California the tallest trees on the planet, or a whopping one-fifth the height of the Space Needle in Toronto. Lengthwise, it's as long as two bowling lanes laid end-to-end, -end, or longer than 12 74Z speeder bikes. Now, like some of the wonkiest vehicles in Star Wars, the Shadow and ATIC were developed originally just as toys. The ATIC in particular being discontinued by Kenner after being kit-bashed together, but still happily making it into the Legends continuity as a very rare variant. I haven't seen if there's any mods for Empire at War or similar strategy games that have the giant ATAHT or M6, but if you know of one, definitely comment down below. Please hit that like button, it really is the best way to help me out. Comment your thoughts and suggestions, but most important of all, remember, I hope General Veers is getting royalty checks from all these variants, and the Force will be with you, always.